Next up, we have Ruth Cheesley, and she will be discussing changing the governance model of an established project. That sounds really interesting. Take okay, away, morning everyone. Thanks for joining me for this session. So yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about our experiences in the Mortic project of changing the governance model. So my name is Ruth Cheesley. You can zap that to connect with me on LinkedIn or just search for my name. Uh, currently, I work full-time for Mortic as the project lead, but I also am co-founder of the Women of Open Source community. Um, feel free to drop me an email if you have any questions, um, and you can follow me on most social medias. So let's start first off by talking about what we actually mean when we're talking about governance in an established project. It was really hard to find a definition of what this actually means in open source. So this is the best I came up with, which is talking about, for me, governance can be as simple as like two paragraphs on a piece of paper or complicated and big for, open, for larger projects. But ultimately, it's about defining how power structures work in your project, about defining how you make decisions in your project. It's about how your community interacts, how you build the stuff you're building, and how you collaborate in your projects. So making sure that that is all documented in some way. So for those of you who might not have come across Mortec before, we're an open source marketing automation project written in PHP and based on the Symfony framework. And we started life as a corporate backed open source project. And what I mean by corporate backed is we had one company that basically owned the brand and the trademark. And it was created in 2014, open sourced under GPL. And then the founder created this company to basically provide enterprise services. We had our first ever community-led release, which was by someone who wasn't employed by that company in 2018, so four years after it was first open sourced. And then in 2019, the company that the founder created was acquired, including the brand and the trademarks and everything to do with Mortic, because it had the same name. It was Mortic Inc. and Mortic the open source community. And in 2020, we established our first governance model working with the company to actually codify and, and explain how we were going to make decisions, how the company was going to be involved in the community. And importantly, we also started using Open Collective to manage our finances transparently. And this is what our first ever governance model looked like. It was very much created in collaboration with the company, wanting to make sure that they could support the project and also to be able to direct the project in some ways. So the important things are at the top here, the pale blue. These have to be from the company who uh, acquired the, the brand. And these four were from the community. So you've got half and half there. And then here, these two, we actually didn't create these steering groups because it was an extra level of complexity we didn't really need, but we had the proviso there in case we needed it. And then the team leads could be anyone, but they were appointed by the project lead. So these, these team lead positions were appointed by the project lead. So this is what we came up with as our first governance model back in 2020. So the key decision-making structures we had back then was the company. So they owned the brand, they owned the trademark, they employed the project lead full-time. And also one of the main engineers get, had half of his time was also an employee of the company. And they appointed the project lead, and they had those positions on the council. The project lead was to provide leadership to the community effectively, and to listen to the community, but also be that bridge between the company and the community, which is quite a challenging role if anyone's ever had to play that before. And then the community council was the next level of um, decision making. And this was, as I mentioned, four company representatives, four community representatives, primarily charged with things that affected the whole project. So things that not just one team could make a decision on, changes that were not easily reversed, or things that involved a lot of money. So in 2023, 20, uh, we found ourselves in the situation where the company needed to step back from their involvement in the, the project. And that meant we needed to find a way forwards because they were embedded everywhere in our community governance model. They were also embedded in terms of providing resources and suddenly that was going to be changing. So the first thing we had to decide was, well, what do we actually want to have as a fiscal structure if we don't have the reliance on this one company to be providing the majority of our resources? 
And it was quite a big decision to make for an open source project. At this point, we've been around nine years. We have about 10,000 people in our Slack community. We've, we're used by 40,000 websites around the world to do their marketing automation. So it's not a small project. Decisions we make are going to have a significant impact. So the first thing that happened was I was the person who actually knew what was going to be happening. And I had to go away and research, well, what might this actually look like? What are the options that we could have breaking away from the company ownership? And what might support what we need and what I felt we want for our community's future? So one option was there's lots of umbrella organizations out there or foundations who will support open source projects. Looking into this, some of them were great, but a lot of them actually wanted to have quite a lot of control over how you did things, what tools you used, and the processes that you follow, and so forth. And sometimes that just didn't fit with the way that we do things in Mortic. Um, but there were lots of positives to this. Some of them actually never replied to our inquiry, so that was their loss. But we did a lot of research into those kinds of organizations. As I mentioned, we used Open Collective, so we're fiscally hosted at this point by the Open Source Collective for our money. But they also provide things like legal support. They can hold brand trademarks. They can provide you with legal support. They can also support you infrastructure-wise. They can uh, employ people as well through remote.com. So the other option was, well, we could continue with the structure we have right now, but use some more of the services that we're not actually currently using. And another option was creating our own nonprofit organizations. And some projects have done this really successfully. Uh, but basically, it would provide all of those services I just mentioned to our own nonprofit. When we looked into this, it was a lot of paperwork, a lot of overhead, quite a lot of costs involved, and also a lot of people, time, and commitment to make it work. And every single person I spoke to across a wide range of open source people said, don't follow this option unless you have no other option available to you, purely because of the resources it takes to actually get set up and managed and what have you. So some of the useful resources that I came across in this process are listed here, and they're also on um, my website, so uh, the speaking website, so if you want to find them later, you can find them there. Governing Open is a really great place to start if you're kind of new to governance or you're having to take on a project like this and you're not really sure what you don't know. It's a really great landing place. Um, this PEP from the Python organization, 8002, has got extensive in-depth reviews of governance from lots of different open source projects. What was good, what was bad, what was ugly, how they changed models, things like that. So that was also a really good stepping off point. FOSGovernance.org, if you need any kind of governance document from a code of conduct to a privacy policy to a how are we going to refuse donations that come from a spammy company, you'll find it on FOSGovernance.org and you can upload your own. So upload your own there as well for others. And also, don't underestimate the, the value of having your personal network. So at this point, I couldn't actually talk really with anyone else, but I could talk with some friends under a strict friend DA to say, look, this is happening, and it's quite big, and I need to bounce ideas off of someone. And they were really, really awesome, both giving me personal support, but also, have you thought about talking to this person? Have you thought about this resource? So the research took a little while. And then I shared with the community council, so the people who weren't involved in the company, what was happening, what the situation was. And these are the options we have. And this is the one I think is probably the most advantageous and sensible for us to follow. And eventually, that was then widened to the whole of the leadership team. So all the team leads and the assistant team leads, once we had had discussions in the council of, yeah, OK, we think that's the right way forwards. And then lots of debate, you know, we're good at open source, uh, debate in open source, right? Well, some people are, some people aren't. So it did involve quite a lot of skillful communication, enabling people to give voice to their concerns and to actually take those concerns seriously and find a way that we could reach a consensus of the right route forward for the project. So we decided in the end, we'd stay with Open Collective. We would use some more of the facilities that Open Source Collective have and we would refactor our governance model to remove the company dominance from the governance model. So we shared the news on 18th of April, and it was one of those moments where you kind of shut your eyes and press the button and don't really know how it's going to land. I was pretty sure that people would be really positive, um, but you're also kind of sort of waiting for the backlash in a way. But actually, it was received really positively. We did have a few people who expressed concerns about the 
stability of the project, for example, and the sustainability. Um, but we were able to kind of communicate around that. So some of the lessons learned from that part of the process it really made a difference to people who don't speak English as their first language that we went to individuals in a very trusted capacity to say this news is breaking, it's really important that our local communities receive this in their language. So we asked them to translate it in a Google Doc for as many languages as we could. They felt valued because we'd approached them with this news before anyone else knew knew about it, but also the community felt really appreciative that we'd taken the time to make sure that they didn't have to try and read through the lines of the English. We could actually just communicate it clearly. Hello. Oh, we're back again. Microphones, eh? If anyone's got any radio devices, turn them off. <laughs> Um, go governance is very emotive. Well, it can be. Some people really don't care, and that can be quite frustrating. But some people really, really passionately care, and they can be positively, passionately caring, and negatively about what your change is. And so I kind of wasn't really prepared for that full spectrum. You know, it wasn't so much of an issue of people who didn't care. It was frustrating, but whatever. But those positive and negatives were quite a challenge at times. And also being available was really, really important. Um, so it really helped to have opportunities like office hours where people could come and chat to me directly about whatever they wanted for an hour each week. We held webinars in each of our multilingual communities with a translator. So I did a bit of a presentation, they translated, and then they were able to translate questions back and forth from people. And again, that made people feel included. It made them feel like they could give their concerns and have it heard. Uh, by the people who are making these changes. So we had to consider the structure that we were going to use. And one of the questions that came out of our governance working group was, do we actually need a hierarchical structure or could we do this with a flat structure? We couldn't actually find any large organizations in open source that had no hierarchical structure. So this was one of the decisions that we made quite early that said we actually feel like we do need to have hierarchy in, in the community. So once we'd made that decision, the, decision was, the, the next question was, right, how do we actually define the structure? How do we decide who leads? We didn't really like having the project lead being the dictator who decides who the team leads, but we hadn't got any structure for anything else at that point. So we did decide that the bits that we liked that were working already was the council worked quite well, but it needed to be democratically elected. The teams worked quite well with team leads and people being able to come up through the ranks grassroots style. And the working groups worked really well, but there was a gap between the two. There wasn't really any way for our grassroots members to have a say in what's happening in the council and for the council to be able to communicate back down. So we established a general assembly, which is a group of people who are members of MORTIC, which I'll come back to later, who are the people who actually decide what happens. And the council are the body that enacts the decisions, basically. So that's the structure that we kind of came up with to fill the gaps that we felt were missing in our current structure. And then we needed to figure out how do we elect a council and not have them all disappear at the same time. And for this, we took inspiration from the Python Software Foundation. We held an election. We had uh, members voting. And basically, the first, second, and third place people got three-year terms, the fourth and fifth people two-year terms, and the fifth and uh, sixth and seventh got one-year terms. And then we'll elect people into three years once their term rolls. So hopefully, that will mean that we don't actually have the entire council disappearing all at once. And then the next thorny subject was, well, who actually manages the project lead? I used to be employed by a company with a manager, and now I'm employed by the community. And we didn't want to have a benevolent dictator for life model. We actually want to have it someone who's in service to the community. So after lots of discussions and decisions, we came up with the idea that actually the project leads responsible to the council, much like it would be in a charity or in a, in a company. Um, and they are directed and managed by the, the council effectively. So we had taken into account the structure, we'd made some decisions there, but then we needed to actually define how do we make decisions as a project. This had never been codified, we just kind of winged it most of the time. But now we actually needed to have that clarified. So the first thing was how do we actually do voting? We needed to find a fair way that would allow people across any topic in the community to ask us to hold a vote for whatever reason. 
And we did lots of research of the different tools that were out there. And um, one that we came up with, which has worked exceedingly well for us, is called Desidim. It's an open source project that's primarily used for election and council engagement in cities like Barcelona. But we've kind of refactored it to be used in an open source community. And we do all of our voting through there. We do all of our meetings through there so that you can see all of the notes from the meetings that happen. Our meetup groups run through there. Uh, basically, anything to do with our community is run through this new portal, um, including voting. As soon as we started to have the voting discussion, people said, well, who, who is allowed to vote? What actually makes it so that you can have a say in our community? We had lots and lots of back and forth. This was an emotive subject. This was one that got people really fired up. We decided to have a paid option, so membership to become an individual member, $100 a year. But if you live in any country where $100 is too much, there's also a Big Mac index which we apply, which basically works out the price of a Big Mac in the US, compares it to the price in your country, and proportionately reduces or increases in Switzerland the amount that you have to pay. Um, so that's one way of becoming a member. Yeah, we were already using that for partnership, for the level that people needed to pay for partnership. So people were familiar with it, so it worked quite well. We also said from the Python Software Foundation, contributing five hours a month. So if we can see activity from your um, personal profile, five hours a month, or if you work on a free and open source plugin for Mautic, which has no commercial involvement whatsoever for at least five hours a month, then we'll consider that contribution based. There's also corporate tiers that start at $1,200 a year and going up to 30 k a year at the moment. And honorary memberships for people who've done exceptional things for the project. So we've just voted our first three honorary memberships for the founder, the first engineer, um, and for the uh, CTO of uh, the company who acquired Mortic because they supported Mortic so much in those early years. So those were the decisions that we made about eligibility. And then people started saying, well, I can contrib contribute more than them, so I want to have more votes than them. And this is a really difficult subject. Here be dragons. There's a lot of complexity, and this could easily be exploited. So in the end, what we did is we decided one member, one vote. End of story. Individual member has one vote. Corporate member has one vote. Honorary member has one vote. It made it much easier, but it was quite a challenge getting there because people were quite strongly in favor of other options. And then in terms of decision making, we actually defined what we consider to be a trivial decision, like uh, what background should we use on our online conferences or whatever. Teams make those decisions. We don't need to have a vote on those. And they can easily be reversed, so it's not a problem to change that. Non-trivial decisions, like how many tracks should we run, who should we have as a speaker, a code situation where there's a couple of different options, but that none is better than the other. It's just... Um, not going to have a major impact and can be reversed. We say with those ones, they need a 36-hour time box. And then for significant decisions which impact across the whole project or have financial impact or that can't be reversed, then there needs to be a two-week time box minimum for decisions to be made. And so we codified that in our governance model to make it really clear. And in terms of coming to the final version of the governance model, um, one thing we found is that we were having a, a working group discussion group in Slack called Govern Working Group Governance, and the discussions moved really fast. There'd be like hundreds of comments back and forth within a day. So we summoned, summed them up in a Google Doc. So if someone came in later, they could look through and see where the discussions have been and where, they've, where they're at now and who's saying what and what have you. And that actually worked really well. Once we got to a point where we had a, something like a first proposal, uh, we shared it on our community forum. So the majority of users of Mautic are marketers, they're not developers, and a lot of them are not in our Slack community, but they go to the forums if they have a problem. So we posted it in the forums purposely with one forum thread for each section and highlighted it and pinned it so that people in the forums would know this was happening and they could go in and have discussions on small chunks rather than the entire thing, which is a bit overwhelming. And again, that worked really well. We reached people who hadn't been involved previously. And once we got to a point where we'd had that time box discussion, we actually had to increase the time box by two weeks because people said there was too much to review in two weeks. We put together the final draft, which you can see here. Again, we posted it in the forum Slack. We talked about it at conferences. We literally, anywhere anyone was, we were telling them about this. 
gave two weeks for feedback, and then finally we were like, right, this is the model we're implementing, and we implemented it in the council. So some of the lessons, long live the time box. I think Angie Webchick told me uh, when I first started as a community manager in open source, time box everything. Give people a specific time in which they have to provide feedback and then you make a decision. And that was so helpful in this process. Uh, delegating research was another good lesson. If somebody seems to be really super passionate about a particular thing, have them go and do the research and bring it back as like a pricey then you don't have to do that research. They're interested in it, so they're probably going to do the research pretty well. And then you can actually make decisions based on that. So it enables them to actually be involved. And definitely keeping it simple. It was really important. I tend to make really complicated things, and people are like, you can like take out all that fluff. Basically, what you're saying is that one line. And that was really important in the governance model. And also these ones, so go where they are. I, I said we posted this everywhere, we engaged people everywhere, but you had to make an active effort to do that. We had to exclude someone because of their conduct in this process, because we really have to make sure you're hot on your code of conduct and that unacceptable behavior is, is highlighted, called out and dealt with properly because it will come up in this kind of emotive subject. And drafting fast and iterating often was also really important. Otherwise, it just becomes this nebulous discussion that never actually goes anywhere. So really put words into paper. And so where we're at now, well, we've actually just recently inaugurated um, the governance model. We voted in our first community elected council through Decidim really successfully. We own all of our own brand and trademarks now through Open Source Collective. And we're now working on um, building up the rest of our governance and moving forward as a project. And so far, we've had 169 people join our portal, uh, our community portal, about 45 contributing members between individuals and companies, and 14 through practical contributions. And the process we held through the um, portal was really successful. We're looking at holding other, co other things like design contests, like who's going to be the next team lead for the community team, things like that are all going to be happening through, through our portal. So the main focus for us going forwards, well, now we've dealt with the governance, is obviously financial sustainability. We don't have a big company we can go back to and say, can we have some more money? So we're trying to broaden our reach now, looking at more membership, wider membership base, and also establishing multiple revenue streams. We're, as always, focused on product adoption growth. As I mentioned, we have 40,000 websites using the tracking, and we want to continue to grow that. And then finally, defaulting everything we do in the community to transparency. Nothing happens behind closed doors. Everything happens on the portal, whether it's discussions about new features, whether it's who should take on a particular role, whether it's meetings that happen in the council. They're all happening transparently. So that's our journey. I'm happy to answer any questions if we have some time. And uh, I will pop these all up on the website later if you want to catch them from there. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> An awesome journey that is. So, questions, Brian? Thank you. So, excellent talk. Um, I have a question. Did you have to educate your community as you went into this, because it sounded like you had pretty good success with the, mm -hmm. the conversations, but is it something that they were like ready for, or did you have to do any kind of prep work for your community and say, you know, this is what we're doing, this is our goal? I mean, like, or did it just kind of flow naturally based on you know the conversation? Yeah, so a, a bit of background. When the ana announcement happened in 2019 of the acquisition, like, the community was sort of split in half. Some were really positive and some were really not happy about the corporate dominance, even though it was there before because Mortic Inc. was a company, but now they were being acquired by another company. So when we announced that this was happening and we were separating and becoming an independent open source project, those people became very happy. We had some community members who literally stopped all association with us when the acquisition happened in 2019 because they didn't agree with the corporate dominance. Um, so for some people, it was really positive. Um, for some people who have based their business on this software, there were some concerns. So we did have to be very clear with them that, that we have got the support for a year. We've got lots of companies in the, in the community now who can all contribute 
as much as they want to because there's no one company. But we also had to be very clear with people, it's now on us. If you want this project to succeed, this is the time you have to step up, contributors-wise, financial contributors-wise, helping us promote the software. Um, so that we couldn't do any pre-warming because of NDAs and stuff before the announcement. But afterwards, we did lots of positive communication, listening, answering, published an FAQ, all of that kind of stuff. There's one at the back. Um, what is Oh, OK. I'll jump in. Hello? Yep. Yes, there we are. OK, so um, you're talking about consensus and mm -hmm. uh, uh, making decisions, I guess, consensus-based in that case. But running a program like, like yours, you will also have minorities, minority opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, have you built how to handle minority opinions into uh, your structure as well? Sort of, by modeling that behavior myself and by encouraging our, team, our leaders to model that behavior. So one of the most helpful things I learned from someone in this whole process was being able to communicate how passionately I care about something. So, and I still use that to this day. So if I'm saying I disagree with something, kind of saying I'm like six out of 10 that we don't do this. And the reason I'm six out of 10 is this, this, and this. Whereas if I really don't agree, but I'm not actually that fussed, it would be like, I'm three out of 10 about this, whatever. So I think we're trying to encourage people to use nonviolent communication. We're trying to encourage people to understand that their view may not be the right view or the only view. And actually, what's most important is what is, what is going to be best for our project. And sometimes you have to step your ego aside and... and be willing to, the, to understand the fact that your view might, including me, might not be right for the whole of the project. But it, and also calling it out when people are not doing that. And one of the biggest issues we have is a multilingual community where lots happens in video calls. And people who don't speak English as their first language sometimes just can't keep up. So we always have an asynchronous conversation before decisions are made after a video call in Slack. So people can actually follow on later and, and have their voice heard. Perhaps if they don't feel confident doing that in a video call, they can have their voice heard later. And so does that answer your question? So I don't think there's any perfect way, but it's like trying to model the behavior, call out bad behavior, and set up the conditions so that people have that chance to be heard in the channel that is most appropriate for them. Um, I'm just looking at your website from uh, Decidim. You, you said you made a custom version of that. Uh, you, Decidim, yeah. Yeah, Decidim. Have you thought about, like, is that thing open source again and, like, made reusable by other open source projects? Because uh -huh. I could use something like that for yeah. my own project. So we actually haven't customized it an awful lot. We've got a couple of plugins to do things that, that we wanted, but the visual is basically core Decidim. Uh, the company, we, I didn't have the time, energy, resources, or knowledge. It's Ruby, and I don't know Ruby at all to do it myself. So we actually contracted a company to set it up and host it for us. And they're building out a, an image which is going to be optimized for open source based on how we're using it. So nobody's ever done it before for an open source project. We're like the first. So they're kind of following what we're doing. And, and I can put them in touch with you if you're interested in following up on that. But Decidim is also a great open source project. I've done a lot of contribution in their docs as well. So, That was yeah. great. Thank you. You're welcome. And thanks, Ruth, for your wonderful presentation. Thanks, everybody, for the questions. Um, big applause. <laughs> <laughs>